Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And the instrument you just heard and saw me perform on is perhaps my favorite instrument, my electric vintage toy organ. I bought this instrument on eBay about five years ago, and when I first brought it into my college dorm room at the time, I kind of joked that I saw it as two things. Um, I first saw it as sort of my ticket to Brooklyn. Um, I needed something weird, something out of tune, and of course something very 1960s in order to get me across that bridge to Manhattan. And I also joked that I kind of saw it as my uh, permanent boy magnet. Um, I needed something heavy, something awkward, and of course something that I always looked like I needed an incredible amount of assistance with in order to have that um, ever-long line of male seekers at the door. And of course, more importantly, my Brooklyn apartment door, let's be clear. <laughs> but, um, and well, I'm happy to say that both of those values have still proven mostly true. Um, more recently, the organ has come to have much greater meaning for me, a meaning that I feel not only applies to me personally, but can really apply to all on a big or small level. And that's because I feel that the organ allows me to navigate something not only musical and not only visual, but rather something beyond ability. And I'm going to attempt to explain why. About 15 years ago, my family and I were involved in a serious car accident during which my left hand was nearly amputated. And therefore, ever since the accident, I feel that it's always been a challenge to find an instrument that really suits my body. One that not only suits my body, but doesn't remind me of the things that won't happen with my impairment. Um, the notes that won't sound, the keys that won't press. And rather, rather, I've always longed to find a musical instrument that does suit my body and reminds me of the things that will and can happen with my impairment the notes that will sound, the keys that will press, and I think most importantly, the possibilities that can emerge. And therefore, with the organ, as you can see, um, it's physical setup with the chord buttons on the left-hand side and the keyboard part on the right-hand side um, feels very comfortable for me to physically perform on. I feel it was almost made for my body, and I say made for my form and made for my deform. And I feel that through performing on the organ, it challenges me to interact and engage with my impairment on a different level, a level that allows my body to navigate a unique environment in its own manner, without comparison or concern of whether it's able or not, formed or not, but if it could be something else, you know, something else that can perhaps be beyond physicality, beyond perception, and even beyond, beyond ability. And therefore, performing with the organ and investigating my body on its own level, within its own manner, has led me to want to create a new social imaginary. An imaginary that challenges traditional notions regarding impairments in the human body, challenges those notions, and specifically challenges the historical stigma towards it. You know, that stigma that categorizes a body that is other, categorizes a body that is different, and sets it aside rather than something to be celebrated, something to be explored, and I think, most importantly, something to be enjoyed. As disability studies pioneer, Rosemary Garland Thompson often expresses, um, disability is really a product of cultural rules about what bodies should be or should do. And she also adds that it's a repository resulting from social anxieties involving vulnerability, control, and identity. She often also adds that um, she has a desire to recast disability from the realm of medicine to that of political minority, and thus from a form of pathology to a form of identity. And therefore, along those lines, I wish to recast disability from a fixed, static imperfection to that of a fluid, creative potential, <laughs> a potential that is not concerned with able or disabled, formed or deformed, functional or non-functional, but rather all the in-betweens those in-betweens that lie within the pillars of possible and impossible, fixed and fluid, static and moving, and those in-betweens that emerge when we're not concerned with the ability of a body or normality of a body, but the imaginary of a body, and a body that can see beyond that virtue of physicality and beyond that virtue, that satisfaction of visibility. You know, that satisfaction of seeing a body move as it should move, act as it should act, form as it should form, and rather, discarding of that false socially constructed ideal and letting a body move as it wants to move, act as it wants to act, form as it wants to form, but I think most importantly, deform as it wants to deform, impair as it wants to impair, and just be as it wants to be. To be without comparison, without juxtaposition, and to be celebrated for that physical difference, that physical diversion it contains. 
and a physical difference that I, for way too long, chose to hide away, chose to cover in long sleeves, um, chose to be my permanent excuse from gym class, um, but rather a physical difference that I now chose to uncover, to reveal, to not be my excuse from gym class, to allow me to become addicted to toy organs, um, but I think perhaps most importantly, in the words of philosopher John Dewey, um, become that individual lens to a perhaps greater truth. And in the words of another favorite philosopher of mine, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, he states that we must learn to see the world as if we knew nothing about it, as if we still had everything to learn. And expanding upon that notion, I feel that we still have everything to learn in regards to physical impairment. And we still have everything to learn in the nuances it contains, the possibilities it holds, and the imaginaries that can emerge. Able or disabled does not have to be black or white, on or off. It can rather be a spectrum of mobility, a range of possibility, and a field of opportunity. A field where physical difference is not only physical, it's not only clinical, and it's not only personal, it's something that's rather emotional, it's political, and it's quite livable, but I think more importantly, something of a miracle. A miracle that sheds a light onto the limits of human perception, the limits of human ability. And those limits that feel too often than not force bodies into conformity rather than complexity, normality rather than vitality. And rather a miracle that sheds a light onto the realm of opportunity, of possibility waiting beyond those limits, beyond those boundaries. And a miracle that for me has been a gift that keeps on giving. A gift that is not only temporary but here to stay. And a gift that doesn't only appear in the darkest of my times or the lightest of my times, but in all my times. And all those times since my accident that I used to think, why me? Why is it me in the very back seat of my parents' SUV? The SUV that flipped on its side and seemingly let my hand fall away from me, fall into the concrete, fall into the bridge, and fall away from me and open up a world that was not made for me, not formed for me. And instead I asked now, why not me? Why can't I be the one to push against that world, to push against that false reality, to push against that social construction, and to push into something else that is perhaps beyond physicality, beyond ability, and beyond perception? And I'll continually attempt to enter this world, I'll continually attempt to play a tiny role on my tiny organ into entering this world. And I encourage you to join me in imagining and creating and in fulfilling what for you could be beyond ability and what for you could be beyond comparison. Um, <laughs> 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 um, and if you don't mind, I'll now finish the piece I started at the beginning of my talk. Um, a piece I wrote to challenge the interaction between my two physically different hands. A piece titled Form and Deform. Thank you very much. Uh.